Evening, all. It's Jim here. Welcome to the first of two live sessions we're doing this evening as a gentle warm up for students getting ready for the Unit 3 exam, which I believe is tomorrow. Tell me in the live chat if I'm wrong. Uh, the idea isn't to cover everything in Unit 3, but just a chance to do some quick fire revision and also have a think about exam technique. So, over the course of either this first session, which is on personal finance, or session two at seven o'clock on business finance, we're going to look at things like the 12 markers. Eight markers, six markers, four markers, and two markers. So a bit of exam technique, but also hopefully a chance just to do a gentle warm-up. Uh, we may come across some stuff that you think, oh, I've forgotten that. Oh, I don't know how to do that. So that might be useful, or it might just uh, help reinforce your confidence before the exam tomorrow. Uh, as always, lots and lots of people in the live chat tonight. So as always, please do put your answers or questions or comments, ideally about Unit 3, into the live chat. And uh, we may even get one or two of them on screen as well. It's always good to put a few of your answers on screen. So this first session is on personal finance. Don't forget, all of our live sessions are rec recorded. So if you wish, you can catch up with this uh, later. We're going to do about 30 minutes on personal finance, then take a break, 10 or 15 minutes, recharge our batteries, grab a coffee, and then we'll do another 30 minutes, 35 minutes or so on business finance. So if we're good to go, Let's make a start. And we're going to make a start, and we'll do this in business finance as well, with the sort of the, uh, the warm-up questions that you get in Unit 3. The two mark, what I call give or state questions. What these are, they appear at the start of Section A, personal finance, and then again at the start of Section B, business finance. And normally, if you look back at past papers, it's not a guarantee, but there are 80 marks awarded across the paper, and normally the examiner puts uh, two of them in Section A and two of them in Section B. There's no guarantee of that, but that's what I would be expecting to see when the exam paper gets to see. So, for example, it could say, give two features of an ISA. Uh, in, that would be Section A, wouldn't it? Or 
state two types of revenue income? Now, it probably won't be those two questions because those two questions came up last time. So what I thought we'd do is do a quick exercise to have a go at these. Now, don't forget, these two markers don't waste a lot of time on them in the exam. They only test knowledge and understanding. The examiner's not writing, expecting you to write an essay or a long answer. So just write a few words, Yes, just half a sentence if you wish. You don't have to write fully constructed paragraphs. But the main thing is to read the stem really carefully, read the question carefully, and make sure you answer accurately as well as quickly. So with that in mind, shall we have a quick go at uh, an activity? I've called it the two marker spinner. Uh, you may recognize this if you've been on our unit two and unit six and unit seven live streams. In fact, every live stream I've ever done, I've used the spinner. So what I've done is I've just picked six topic areas here from the unit three personal finance spec, and I'm going to spin the wheel. It's as much fun for you as it is for me because it's purely random. And over to you, really. Have a go, maybe in the live chat, or if you're just jotting some notes down. What would you write if it said, give me two providers of personal financial advice? What would you put? What do you think? Don't forget two marks going for this. So you want literally only want to spend a minute, minute and a half, if that. And I'll see if I can stick one or two answers. I've got an answer for this, but I'm always more interested to see uh, what you're going with. Uh, Maya's one of the first in there with Citizens Advice Bureau. That's magic, isn't it? These answers appear magically like that. Uh, lots of people going for Citizens Advice. Uh, let's have a look. We've got an independent financial advisor and Citizens Advice. Now, don't forget, the question was, give me two. So that has given me two. Debt counsellors is a good one, isn't it? Yep, debt counsellors would almost certainly be working with individuals to give them advice. So Ryan's gone for the same thing, debt counsellor. Awesome stuff. Don't forget, quick fire answers in the exam. But the question was, give me two. And it will be two, likely. So uh, let's remove those. I'll add some more questions to the screen. Here's mine. I went with the independent financial advisor, IFA, and debt counsellor. And that's all you need to write. No sentences. Just move on. Quick fire questions just to get you going two marks out of 80 in the bag should we try another well we're going to even if you don't want to so uh, let's see what the, the spinner comes up with this time let's see who's first into the live chat oh i thought it was gonna be functions of money but it's not it's landed on give me or state two products commonly researched on price comparison websites like compare the market or go compare or money saving expert or other, obviously other price comparison websites are available uh aaron was uh, pretty quickly in there insurance uh, electricity or yeah or energy jess went for car insurance telephone bills yeah mobile bills maybe moody's gone for two types of insurance yeah you probably get away with that to be honest with you i would if you just went Car insurance, I'd try to pick a different product just to be absolutely sure. Harry's gone for, um, he's obviously in the traveling mode, insurance and hotels. Yeah, Felicia's gone for utilities. So yeah, energy prices, gas, electricity, all that kind of stuff. Superb. Well done. And um, lots of great answers coming in. What did I go with? I can't remember. I wrote this this afternoon. Uh, car insurance. Yep. Yeah, mortgages. Don't forget financial products are uh, very popular aren't they on um, so for example um, mortgages or credit cards and uh, yeah i went for airline flight prices but main thing here is you don't waste any time with these quickly get your answers down save some time for later let's do another one quick revision here of personal finance what's it gonna land on what do you think let's have a look Ah, features of a bank overdraft. Give me or state two features of a bank overdraft. Don't forget, we're looking at this from the point of view of personal finance. Bank overdraft is one of those topics such as uh, higher purchase, potentially leasing that straddles in business finance as well. Let's have a look. Linear's first in there, high interest. Quick cash, says Nicholas. Yeah, it's quick. It's a short term. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, what have we got here? It's, uh, don't forget, we were looking for two. So this is going for the rate of interest. Uh, you could be a bit more precise with that, but I know exactly what you're saying. Obviously, well, this is just in a live chat, but that would be a good uh, a good feature, wouldn't it? Uh, Pippa's being a bit more precise, having spent five extra seconds. Yeah, higher interest rates or high interest rates. 
Uh, easy access in the sense, yeah, it is easy. If you've got a facility, it's easy to use. So ease of use. Once you've agree, arranged your bank overdraft, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to call the bank each time. It's there for you. And Jack's making that point as well. Quick access to money. Super. Well done. I went with uh, temporary. So it's not meant to be a long-term thing. It's meant to be something you dip in and out of for occasional use. So I'll explain that as a, not explain, I'll just write that down. And also I went with uh, one of the things I think Jack and others went with the high interest rate charge. Yeah, bank overdraft typically has a high, a very high interest rate. Baba Tumbe says, uh, Jim, please pick my comment. Oh, there we go. I've just picked it for you. I'll look out for more of your answers as we go to the next one. I think we've got one more of these. Move two. Let's spin the wheel again. Fast pace this session. Fast pace revision. And oh, it's landed on features of travel insurance. So a lot, a number of people have mentioned insurance already. What do you think? Features of travel insurance. Babatunde, you're such a beg. I'm just, I'm just going to have to translate that comment in the live chat. I think it means that Babatunde is getting a bit of a bit of. A bit of grief for asking for, for the comment to be put on the screen, but that's fine. Features of travel insurance. It doesn't say types of travel insurance, is it? Yeah. So the question wasn't give me types of insurance. It's features of travel insurance. Yeah. So what have we got here? Um, cancellation and delays covered. Yeah. What else have we got? Features. Yeah. Uh, Moody's got another some two different ones there. Coverage of medical costs. Let's say uh, you... You know, take an ill on holiday. Uh, often the travel insurance has included uh, health insurance or medical insurance. And yeah, coverage of lost luggage, lost bags. What else have we got here? Loads of answers coming in. Apologies. I'm having to scroll down here as I speak. Um, yeah, Fraz has gone for injury and lost items, so lost baggage. So, for example, travel insurance is particularly useful, particularly important if you're going skiing. Uh, if some of you are going skiing in... Uh, half term or Easter, I would go skiing, but I'd only go skiing provided they gritted the slopes. I think that's really important. Uh, Freya's going for cancellation, medical, lost luggage. You just need two. You just need two. That's superb answer, that one. Let's see what else we got here. I went with trip, cancellations, delays, medical coverage, and baggage loss. And of course, if all of those three things happen to you, you'd be pleased that you had um, Health insurance. Now, let's move on. We've done our two markers. Now, don't forget there's another mark question called explain. Now, these can be two marks, but on section A, they're often, in fact, usually four marks. So there is a slight difference in exam technique here. With two marks on the uh, state or give, it's just write a couple of words down. Explain requires you to write a little bit more. So they do appear in both section A and section B. In section B, they tend to be two markers. In section A, they tend to be four markers. And normally, there are two. So typically, there'll be, uh, what? Uh, that would be eight marks, wouldn't it, in section A for uh, <coughs> the explain questions. What's the difference between two and four marks? How many things you're asked to explain. So if it just says one, explain one, two marks. If, explain, if it says two, you need to have two sentences or two uh, two responses. So... The key thing to remember is these are still warm-up questions, so you need to be precise with your knowledge and understanding. You do need to write in short sentences rather than just scribbling a few words down. However, don't write an essay. So for each thing you're asked to explain on the four-mark explain questions or two-mark explain questions, state the point very quickly. Don't repeat the words of the question, just state the point, and then add what I would call a development sentence, just a few more words that help explain the point that you've stated. That's what we're looking for. Uh, so, for example, I think we've got an example coming up. Here is a question that appeared on the last exam paper for Unit 3. You might have seen it before. Uh, it said, this was in Section A, explain two disadvantages for the consumer of using a payday loan to pay for a holiday. So I've just highlighted in yellow there. Unfortunately, the examiner doesn't highlight the questions for you. But it is worth just highlighting or underlining. So explain two. Well, we know it's two because there's four marks. It's from the point of view of the consumer. And what's the situation? So it's about payday loans, payday loans, but using it to pay for a holiday. So that's just the main thing. We've got a bit of context there. And uh, so I think we'd need two answers for that. So I would write very high rate of interest and then just a sentence. So the customer may struggle to afford the repayments on the holiday. So in other words, the holiday costs a lot more. So that's a, that's a 
a disadvantage, isn't it? If you pay for a holiday using a payday loan. And also a potential disadvantage, you need to repay the money very quickly. So you may not, you know, you may have to have repaid it either whilst you're on holiday or as soon as you get back. So that's the idea. So over to you. We're going to do a couple of these. I've picked out three or four practice questions. Now, I've picked out topics that haven't been examined specifically before or recently. They have been maybe years ago, but also ones which I think, oh, if that came up, one or two students might think, what is that? But it is, these are in the spec. Here's your first one. So over to you. Uh, two marks this one. So we just need one. Explain to me an advantage to a consumer of using citizens' advice. Adam's just making the point, whilst uh, the rest of you are typing, that um, he's here for every session and, and therefore his comments need to be on screen. Well, there we go. They're on screen, but not for long. So an advantage. So uh, can you develop the point? So don't forget, I mean, obviously in the, in the live chat, in the live chat window, you're not going to be typing lots and lots. So let's just pick one of them here out. I think Brogan's made the point that a number of people use his advice is free to use. And another, per another person's making the point that it's unbiased. In other words, impartial. They don't have something to sell you. Uh, an onion user, so thanks for contributing, unknown, says it's free and professional. Myers developed the point, had a little bit more time to develop it. It's free, so that's an advantage. And comparing it with other services, such as independent financial advisors who, uh, who do charge fees. Jesse's making the point that it's free to use but then explaining why it's an advantage. So there we go. There's your two marks, because it could be that that's particularly important for the kind of people who often need to use citizens' advice, because it's often people who are uh, struggling when it comes to um, uh, personal financial uh, issues, like maybe at lack of cash or maybe have issues with, with debt. So that's exactly the kind of thing we're looking for there, Jess. Great answer. Lots of other great answers coming into the live chat. Here's what I went with. I went with the point that most of you have gone with. It's free, impartial advice. And I, to be honest with you, I've probably written a few too many words here, but I just wanted to explain to the examiner that it's free, it's unbiased, and you're going to get uh, that might be a you know, that might be a really useful thing if you need advice on things like consumer rights and debt management. So it's un, I think the unbiased guidance is is a really useful thing. A citizens' advice is an amazing service, absolutely amazing. Let's have a look at our next one. Over to you again. Ah, now this time it's four marks, isn't it? So what does that mean? We need to explain two. In this case, it's two advantages of using financial services provided by a credit union. Hmm. What do you think? Do you know what a credit union is? What do you think? Say, so, Hal, I've picked you. You're on the screen, but not for long. What do you think? Now, the live chat has gone suspiciously quiet. Oh, no, I haven't said that. Uh, we we have some great answers coming in. Uh, for example, um, let's pick out oh, so loads of answers coming in here. A great answer coming in from Dylan. This looks amazing. Members are part owners. Therefore, the company or the credit union has a goal of... Uh, Making profit, members gain more money on top of their initial. Actually, I said it was a great answer. I'm not. It started well, but it, it kind of drifted a little bit. So anyway, <laughs> um, that's not to say it's not a bad answer. You probably still get the marks. Um, let's go. For, what are some great answers coming through here? Let's. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is where I thought the previous answer was going. So Dino has said one advantage. Obviously, we'd need two. It's run by its members. Therefore, in theory, and in fact, it is credit unions tend to offer cheaper financial services products, for example, cheaper loans. If you've ever seen the uh, the film or the Netflix uh, film Bank of Dave, that's that kind of idea and uh, particularly useful for those who are struggling to access uh, access formal finance. Love those. Let's see what I went with. Quick fire session, this one. I went with, yeah, more affordable borrowing. So credit unions, because they're owned by their members, they are a collective they offer lending at much lower interest rates than, say, payday sharks, sorry, payday loans or banks. But I needed the second one, didn't I? And I just went with ethical lending. So again, because credit unions are run, are owned by the members of the credit union, they the lending is often for the purpose of local 
you know, local good, local communities, or to support to support those in the local communities. So more likely to be lending uh, for ethical ethical good reasons. Okay, <laughs> have we got another one of these? We got yeah, we have. What about this one? Ah, this is a good one. This is, this hasn't come up well. well. Hasn't come up recently. Explain two disadvantages of investing in shares or stocks and shares. So, what do you think? <laughs> Lots of requests to um, to get comments on the screen. I'll maybe pick a few later. Uh, by the way, don't keep putting the same request in, Ilmed. So shares often comes up and it's often sort of viewed in a positive light in the questions. Of course, there are lots of advantages of investing in stocks and shares. But what if the question was two disadvantages? What do you think? Uh, Sumer is asking, are credit unions protected by the F FCA? I believe they are. Yeah, they are regulated. They are regulated. Yeah, so Christian's in there. Lots of other people are saying uh, the value of the shares may depreciate, may fall, so you can lose money as well as gain money. Uh, Nicholas is making the point that they're risky and there's no guaranteed return. And that's true. They are relatively high risk, uh, and also there's no guarantee that the share price will go up or that you'll receive a dividend. So in that sense, there's no guaranteed return. Um, yeah, Colden's making the same point. A disadvantage is that shares, the value of shares, share price could fall which means that you could lose some or all of the money that you've invested. Superb. There's loads of answers coming in here. You get the idea, don't you? So with a four marker, what's that? You've got basically five minutes to answer that. If you can get two points down with a nice development sentence after your point, I think you're going to do that in about three minutes, three and a bit minutes. So that's going to save you two minutes for, for later. Um, let's see what I went with. I went with a chance of loss. Lots of people in the live chat mentioned that. So the value of shares can go up or down. Um, so, but, you know, that's why people invest in shares, isn't it? Because they expect them to go up. And also volatility. I think that's a quite interesting thing. A lot of people mention risk. There's a lot of volatility in the share prices, literally by the second, by the day, by the week, by the month. Shares can keep on going up and then all of a sudden they crash and... As an investor, that can be quite hard to get your head around. So you've got to be have you've got to have the right sort of personality, the right attitude to investing in stocks and shares. And if you don't like volatility or uncertainty, that's definitely a disadvantage for some people of investing in shares. We have one more. I think it's one more. Give me an advantage or two. We need to of opening a student current account. Interesting question about uh, should you invest in shares or not. Um, over the long term, for what it's worth, investing in stocks and shares outperforms most other investments other than uh, things like investing in housing. Uh, but that's there's no guarantee that will be uh, the same for every investor. And, of course, in the long term, we're all dead, aren't we? So it's all it's, it's a tricky one, investing in stocks and shares, but they can be a very a very effective way of investing. Uh, please take independent financial advice before investing in them. What do we think? Um, let's have a look. Yeah, lots of great answers here. Uh, let's pick Julian's there. Julian's saying incentives, so little perks and incentives. And the second point, uh, little or no interest on uh, borrowing, perhaps no interest on a, um, a low, low, disc, low interest loan. Uh, Megan's gone for, yeah, a great feature here, an overdraft allowance, often free, low interest rates, and then benefits, incentives, perks, such as. Great stuff. Nice, nice development. Discounted travel. Um, Jim Bross has gone for uh, travel as well. Uh, Fatima's picked out the the incentives point. Great point. And what I like about that is that's the development, isn't it? So your point would be incentives to open an account, such as a free rail uh, rail card uh, or cash payments. The student the student rail card is absolutely all day long. You need to have because it pays it back, it pays itself back within within about five minutes of being on the train. Some great answers coming in. I don't have a chance to stick them all on. I will try and get some more on as we go. I went with no fees and interest 
on the overdraft. Typically, you get a free a free overdraft, not a massive one, but a free one. And that can and why is that that's an advantage? Well, that can help reduce the cost, can't it, of, of running your finances? Particularly if you're a student, money is often tight as a student. In fact, you get, it's often tight if you're not a student. And also, yeah, I went with the one that lots of lots of others and fair and others went with incentives and perks, such as vouchers, gift cards, to attract students to open an account. Love it. Uh, Baba Tunde is uh, back in again. Jane, Jim, my teacher says you waffle too much, but she's your biggest fan. Moving on. <laughs> Right. Now, we've got two more things to do in our uh, next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so before we take a break. We're going to have a look at six mark questions and then we'll have a look at a 12 mark question. Uh, so don't forget, in Section A, 28 marks out of the uh, out of the 80 are for personal finance. Now, with the six mark discussion questions, there will be one in Section A and there'll also be one in Section B. Now, Section B also has sort of an eight mark analysed question and some calculation questions. But there will be, should be, a six mark discussion question in Section B as well as Section A. It's always going to be worth six marks. So in other words, get the discussion bit right, and it's 12 out of the 80 in your paper. So I've put some on, on screen there, some recent examples of the discuss questions, discuss questions in section A. So uh, there's the one I think most recent one, discuss whether Taylor should save her own money for the renovations or borrow from a bank. And often they they basically involve discussing, discussing whether a move is the right a one is a decision a, a smart one from a personal financial point of view now don't forget this is the six marks and above it's this the first time where our mark schemes come into play so four marks and below it's just knowledge yeah but five marks and above six marks and basically and above we have to start to demonstrate our mark schemes and we get marked at the highest level that we've received so which is the right level of response? So not only do we need to show knowledge and understanding, we need to use context or application. So they give you a case study, give you a STEM. The more you use that, that's where you get your context. And also our points need to be developed. We need to show analysis. So there's no evaluation in the six mark question. So we just need to make sure that we respond in context, that's application. But most importantly, your answer needs to be balanced. So you need to show two sides of the question. Consider both sides of the question. Now, we'll deal with this now. So we'll mention it briefly when we do uh, business finance after the break. But to show application, the, the trick in section A is to think about the financial position of the person or person's concern. So think about what life stage they're at. What financial needs does she or he have? And the situation that he or she is in. So just think about the life stage and mention the life stage. Think about the situation and the financial needs. That will be enough. And if you pick out those hooks from the, from the content, from the, uh, from the context, that will be enough. Same thing when we come to section B, business finance, you'll be given a situation about a business. We'll have information about the business. Often there'll be some calculations, some ratios. So again, just think about the financial position of the business, what it wants to achieve, and then apply your answer. And that's the key. Okay, so when we talk about balance, that was application. When we talk about balance, it's really just saying that your answer has considered both sides. So really the way to do that is to just have two paragraphs. And one paragraph might look at the, the pros, the advantages, and the second would focus on the cons. But also you can show balance within the paragraph. So you can use words such as, of course, this isn't always the case, or however, or whilst. Those kind of words help show balance as you're writing. So make sure that whatever you write for your six markers is balanced. So you really need two paragraphs, and of course, most importantly, in context. So let's uh, let's have a go. And uh, we've got a little mini case study. Let's read the case study together, and then I'm going to pass it over to you to, uh, to tell me what you think the answer is. So uh, this is... All about Mandy. Uh, she's just retired from her job as a senior police officer. She's divorced and she's got a 16-year-old daughter living with her. She's called Molly and Molly is studying a sixth form and plans to go to university. Now, Mandy has recently received a lump sum, tax-free actually as well, of £75,000 from her pension. She's just retired 
and is considering whether to use this to repay the £50,000 owed on her house mortgage. So she still owes £50,000 on the mortgage and she's paying 3% interest on that. Mandy has limited savings, other than the lump sum, but no other personal debts. Mm. Okay, so here's the question. Discuss whether Mandy should use that pension lump sum to repay the remaining amount on the mortgage. Six marks. What do you think? What do you think? Well, the way to do this is to be balanced, to show two sides. In other words, an argument why she should, an argument why she shouldn't, but in context. That's what we're looking for. So over to you. What do you think? I've come up with an answer. What I think is a decent answer, but what do you think? Don't have to write the whole thing out, but give me a reason for saying, yeah, Mandy should repay the mortgage. What do you think? I'll give you uh, maybe 30 seconds to type some thoughts into the live chat. It's great to see a number of people who were studying hard as well for Unit 2. Lots of answers coming in. I'll pick two or three out. Uh, Leonie, who was one of my Unit 2 collective, the crew, uh, talking about the advantages here, it gets rid of all debts. In other words, Mandy is debt-free. The mortgage is her last debt. Um, the daughter wants to go to uni. She's got limited savings. She's now free of debt. The house is hers. It's a nice one. Danny's saying, would you explain what a mortgage is first? No, not really. You don't need to. As long as somewhere in, somewhere in your answer, it was obvious that you knew it's a loan that's secured on a house. And once the mortgage is paid, then you are the owner. You, well, you are the owner, but you don't. You're not. You don't owe anything. Owe anything for the house. That would be fine. So you don't need to define mortgages. What's Jess gone for here? Pros: No need to repay any other debts. She's able to focus on helping fund her daughter's uni studies. There we go. So you can develop a nice paragraph there. That's all you need to do. And then you've also started the uh, the counter arguments. There's our balance. Um, it would leave her with limited savings, uh, and um, you know, her income is, is diminished because she's no longer working. What have we got? Some other ones here. Short term would release stress. Yeah, possibly. Uh, but might cause long term issues with limited savings. Why? Well, because we've used, what, two thirds, haven't we? Two thirds. Lily's making that point here, just developing, using the case. This is what we mean by context. By using the data, you've worked out that she'd only have £25,000 left, which isn't much of the £75,000. And therefore, that's potentially a downside, isn't it? Uh, some great answers coming in. Awesome. Absolutely love it. <laughs> love it. Well done. Let's see what I went with on this one. So we need, uh, we need to be in context and we need to be balanced to show two sides of the argument. Uh, well, I probably put too many words here. I'll just go through it and see what you think. Although paying the mortgage will use two thirds of a lump sum, by paying off the balance, Mandy may benefit from a greater peace of mind and financial security. And don't forget I mentioned, if you can refer to the life stage, so she's entering the retirement life stage. It comes to us all eventually. This is because she'll no longer have to pay a monthly mortgage, which can be substantial. And she'll be the full owner of the house. So therefore, that shows what a mortgage is. Uh, since she's now retired, her monthly income is likely to be lower because she's no longer earning her police salary. However, uh, her monthly pension is probably going to be enough for day-to-day -day spending now that she's no longer paying for the mortgage. Yeah. So therefore, she should be in decent position to be able to help Molly through university. She's still got £25,000 left. So I think that's I think that's all right, isn't it? I think that says, yeah, that's a good reason for using it. Yeah, pay it off. Why not? But we need a bit of balance, don't we? So over to you. Someone give me a counter argument. Say, Mandy, don't do it. Don't spend £50,000 of your lump sum repaying your mortgage. What do you think? We need a counter argument, don't we? We need balance. We need to, we need to show the examiner that we're prepared to consider both sides of the situation. We don't need a decision because that will be an evaluation question. What do you think? Don't do it. In other words, don't do it. Number of people asking, what's a pension? It's a regular payment 
to, to, to generate a fund that will look after you in retirement, including a lump sum. Let's have a look, see what we've got coming through here. Yeah, actually, well, I'm not sure about the username, but uh, actual cow, could be an actual cow. No, don't do it, Mandy, because you can get a higher interest on savings. So if you invested the 70, whatever, 70, 75,000 pounds, you could probably earn more than the cost of your mortgage. So actually, don't do it. You're only saving 3%. If you pay off the mortgage, you might be able to get a much better return um, on your money. That's an interesting argument, isn't it? Let's scroll down here to all these great answers coming in. Yeah, Nicholas, Nicholas is saying, uh, let's have, what have we got here? Yeah, you're just saying, look, there's an alternative here, which is actually you don't need to. You don't need to pay that mortgage. The, the, the mortgage is just something you pay off gently. You can continue to pay it off in the long term. So why? Why use all the money or two-thirds of the money to do so? Well done. Let's see what I went with. I think I went with a slightly shorter. I've said that. It wasn't slightly shorter. Um, I've gone with the counter argument that says, why not invest the money instead? So on the other hand, whilst eliminating the mortgage may provide peace of mind, a bit of balance there, Mandy might be better off investing the lump sum. So by investing, so just develop the point, by investing the £75,000 in savings such as ISIS, we're going to talk about ISIS briefly for the next five minutes, Mandy might achieve a higher return, say over 5%, than she's currently paying on her mortgage rate, 3%. So that's using the case study. This would allow her to build her savings whilst keeping flexibility if emergency funds are needed. Now, why is that important? Well, let's bring Molly into the story here. While with Molly nearing university, unexpected costs might arise. Uh, she might need to provide whatever it is. Who knows? Um, so you know, why? Why spend £50,000 of your lump sum paying off a debt that you can afford when you can just invest it and get a better return? That's what I went with. Now, is that good enough? Yeah, it's good enough for six marks. Probably too long. Six marks, there's no decision required, there's no evaluation. Therefore, don't waste too much time on it. Save yourself some time by being really quick with the two markers, by being sharp and quick with the four markers, by being really smart and quick on the six markers for the 12 mark question. So last 10 minutes now, there will be a 12 mark question in paper in section A. Two 12 mark questions. So there's one in section A, there's one in section B. It's worth 12 marks. And this is the question in personal finance where we need to evaluate, evaluate, which means we need a decision. Now, I won't spend too long on the mark scheme, but basically the only thing that's different is that the examiner wants you to come to a well developed, balanced, coherent evaluation. In other words, a decision where you recommend what you think the answer is, but it's balanced. It's considered the alternatives, it's justified the decision, and it's also coherent. In other words, it flows from the arguments that have followed. That's what we're looking for. So 12 marks, this is the big question on, on section A, you need to be spending 15, 20 minutes on this. And it's all about considering the data you get given. So let's have a look. If you look at the last bunch of 12 markers in section uh, section A, they've typically always been about giving you a table of information about some different products, financial services products. For example, it could be credit cards or savings accounts or insurance products or whatever it is. Typically, it's four. And you're asked to decide which would be the most suitable. Now, it's evaluate. So you need to recommend one, but you need to show that you've balanced your, you've, you've considered all the different options and explained why. So we'll have a look at this. Don't forget, it's the only question where there's marks for evaluation. Typically, you get given four options. I think the first thing to do is to deal with what you believe to be the two worst options. So I would start with a, a paragraph that says, of the four options considered or offered, the two which I, I believe are least suitable are option whatever, option whatever, and here's why. So just a sentence or two that says, here's why they appear to be the least suitable. It could be that there's a similar product that with a better return or better option, or it could be that it's not suitable for the situation the person's in. So deal with the two that are least suitable, but you have to deal with all four, deal with the first two and explain why you're rejecting them. 
then move on. So what I would then do is I would then deal with the two options that are left and deal with each of those in a paragraph because your recommendation is going to come as a conclusion. So pick, you've got two options left. You've rejected two. Pick the next one and then build an argument that says, well, here's why that might be useful. And ideally comparing it, maybe one or two pieces of the data. Comment on why it might not be useful. Again, comparing. Yeah, do that for both those two options that are left. You've now analyzed all four options. What's left? Yeah, last paragraph, a decision. So all it needs to say is, I recommend that the most suitable product for whatever X is. Then go on a sentence to say, I justify this because, and then it's a sentence that explains why you've come to that decision. And what does it, what does it depend on? So what factor has influenced your decision. That's what we need. So it doesn't need to be a whole page, but make it really clear, a sentence, a paragraph at the end, what your decision is, having dealt with all four, but majored on the two that you think are the most likely. That's what you need to do for the 12 marker. Let's finish off then with a little, I'm not, we're not going to go through a full answer to this, but I'm just going to ask for your thoughts on it. I wanted to pick this because I think it's a really interesting area, savings accounts, and uh, just for five minutes, let's just have a think about how we might approach this question. So, Ollie is 23 years old, so it will typically be about an individual. After completing his degree and spending time traveling, he started working and he earns £30,000. He's got student debts of £40,000 and limited savings as he likes to spend on travel and sporting trips when opportunities arise. However, now that he's got steady disposable income, he wants to invest a small amount each month to help him build a deposit for a home in the future. Ollie has researched four possible ISAs shown in the table below. And the question is, evaluate which ISA is most suitable for Ollie. So you're gonna be given a table of four options, whatever it is, insurance products, in this case, ISAs, could be savings accounts, credit, could be any personal financial product, couldn't it? So your first task is to think, well, which two, based on the situation the person is in, are least suitable? Now, there's no right answer to this. The examiner doesn't have a list of the least suitable or the most suitable, as long as you eliminate two to start with and then choose one from the remaining two, you're gonna be in good shape. What do you think? What do you think? Which of those do you think is least suitable for Ollie? Can you reject one or even two of them just based on information? So you've got uh, two cash ISAs, a lifetime ISA, and a stocks and shares ISA. Some information about the interest rate. Some inter information about the fees that get charged and also some information about withdrawal rules. So let's have a look. Uh, I'll stick it on the. I'll stick some question, uh, answers on the screen as they come in. Leonie's gone for. Uh, I'll, I'll take the comment off short, so you can see the table again. The most suitable first city bank and Boston Building Society. So you've gone for cash ISAs, uh, and they maybe choose between the two of them. You've gone for least prudent investment and your savings PLC. What do we think? And then as you're thinking about that, which one do you think you would choose and why? What do you think? So picking up some great comments coming here. Sean's picked out First City Bank has no withdrawal restrictions, which might encourage him to go on more trips. That is perfect application. So we're told that he likes to go on trips, but he doesn't have a lot of money in savings. Therefore, you may want to dip into his ISA if he sees on a trip that he wants to go on. So therefore, no withdrawal restrictions might make might be an important thing for him. Therefore, that might make First City uh, more attractive. What do we think? Lily's making a point here. Let's put this one on the screen here. The cash ices are better than the stocks and shares as the money back is guaranteed and you might lose money on a cash ISA. So, so yeah, so we don't, depending on Ollie's, so uh, it depends on point, it will be depending on Ollie's attitude to risk 
He might not want to have the risk of losing money on the stocks and shares ISA. Therefore, he's more interested in a, in a guaranteed return. And therefore, if that's the case and he wants access to his money, uh, the two cash ISAs might be the two to, to zero in on. Uh, Adam's making the point that, um, and also Mr. Wolf, you're making the same point. Prudent is the worst as you can't withdraw until you're 60 years old. Well, that is, a, that is an argument against it, isn't it? We'll come back to lifetime ISAs just briefly in a second. However, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, somebody else is saying uh, that uh, prudent is a good choice. It deters Ollie from overspending and increasing his debt. So he can also withdraw it for a house for a specific purpose. In other words, it matches what he was looking for. This is some, there's some great stuff here. You're in good shape for tomorrow here. The key is the examiner doesn't know what the right answer is. They're not bothered what the answer is. They want you to address all four options and then deepen your analysis of the two that you think are more suitable. And then most importantly, come to a balanced and reasoned recommendation. Here's the one I've picked and why. Yeah, that's all you need to do for the 12 marks. So I'm not sure what the answer is. I think if I was advising him, I would advise him to put some money into the lifetime ISA with prudent investments. I think that's what my recommendation would be. So I would say, uh, having looked at the three of them, the recommendation is the lifetime ISA. Why? Because I think it's most suitable for his intended purpose, which is to build a deposit for a house. A lifetime ISA has low interest rate. So that's a, a negative. It's low. However, for every pound you put in, the government puts in an extra 25%. So in other words, the actual interest rate is 26.25%. So every year you can put a thousand pounds in and the government add an extra 25% to it, which is an amazing rate of return. However, you can only use it if you then use the ISA for a deposit or to purchase, to help purchase a house. So if you don't use it for that purpose, if you withdraw money, you lose the pen. In fact, the government charge you back. They take the money back off. You can actually end up with less. So there's a specific ISA that I think works for this for this guy ollie but that doesn't mean it's the right answer i've justified it so it, you could argue that actually for ollie in his life stage he needs access to his cash therefore you might argue that withdrawal restrictions perhaps are less uh, are more interesting more useful for him therefore first city bank decent rate of interest no restrictions or fees put your money in there mate see where it takes you go off on a holiday. So it doesn't matter what the answer is as long as you justify it. Uh, a good question coming in there. Can you argue that you should split the money into two ISIS? Absolutely you could. And that would be a really nice way of adding a sentence at the end of your 12 marker to say, I've recommended prudent investments. However, if he maybe has some spare money, maybe anything over a thousand pounds, it will be worth him also investing in maybe one of the cash ISIS to, to further improve his returns. All day long, you can add a bit of a bit of balance like that. Love it. Right there we go. Um, what have we done? We've uh, we've done what 40, 40 minutes, forty five minutes there on personal finance. Now the session was a little bit longer than I was expecting, mainly because we've done a little bit of exam technique there. 12 markers, six markers, talking about the four mark explain questions. So we're going to take a break for ten minutes. Literally, grab a cup of coffee, grab, grab a cup of tea, glass of water. We're going to do about 30 minutes, 35 minutes on business finance. The link's on the uh, the YouTube channel. Hopefully you can join me for that. If you found it useful, please give me a thumbs up. Uh, the, the videos are being recorded, so once this is finished, the, the comments will be open. If you want to ask any comments or questions, uh, pass me any feedback on the video once this is done. Hopefully I'll see you at 7 o'clock for half an hour or so on business finance. Go grab your calculator if you're going to join me. But for now, see you later.